Have you ever felt like God was far away? Like He's at the edge of your vision, but every time you try to focus on Him, He slips away. As if you can't find the connection between a man who lived so many centuries ago and the events of your life today. As you walk through the door this morning, bearing the burdens of life in our fallen world and of your own sinful nature, you didn't feel the relief you sought because you aren't sure that God's Word reaches far enough to work on you and your life. Or perhaps your worry isn't for yourself. Perhaps it's for someone whom you love dearly, who you think is far away from God. At least the way, that's the way it seems to you. You pray for them often, but you just aren't sure that they can hear God's Word, a Word you cherish so much. Well, I have good news for you. In our gospel text for today, Jesus demonstrates in the lives of two individuals, two Gentiles, a powerful and comforting truth for those who feel far away from God. And that's the truth that God's Word does what it says whether near or far. This morning we read two accounts in the gospel reading of miraculous healings done by Jesus, and they're significant because they're done for non-Jews, because it's about to happen in the book of Mark that Jesus' ministry is going to shift not just to the lost sheep of Israel, but to all nations, fulfilling the promise long ago given to Abraham. But as we look at these two interactions, particularly the way that Jesus deals with them, His approach is so different in the two cases. In one, He seems dismissive and even harsh to the woman who is seeking His his help for her daughter. In In the other one, He is very close, viscerally close, as the children so adequately put, the interaction makes you want to just say, ew. Now, there are reasons for these differences, but ultimately the end results of their interactions with Jesus are the same. He uses His Word to heal them. He uses His Word to lift the burden of sin that is afflicting them. And that is what brings us comfort today. Now, first, we're going to look at the account with the Syrophoenician woman. In the first couple of verses in this account, is set the scene for this interaction, right? The last couple of weeks, we've been going pretty consecutively here through the book of Mark, and Jesus has had a couple of face-offs with the Jewish leaders, and now He is leaving the Jewish lands for a bit of a retreat and a reprieve from the conflict. And the text even says He's trying to be sneaky, Jesus is trying to be incognito. He doesn't want people to know He's there. But then the text also says right after that, but you can't hide Jesus. So verse 24 says, and from there He arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and He didn't want anyone to know, yet He could not be hidden. This seems to be a retreat from the conflict. And there's a theme in Mark that He's It's not the right time for the battle to commence between him and the religious leaders uh, among the Jews. So he retreats. But we know that his mission is bigger than just to the Jews. In Mark, there's a common theme of massive crowds following Jesus everywhere, even pressing in on him, and of people hearing about the amazing things that Jesus has done, and they seek him out. Well, even in the region of Tyre and Sidon, this holds true. A woman who's heard of him, a Gentile woman, comes to find him. And Mark makes a point to explicitly state her Gentile identity in verse 26. He wants us to know that the person that Jesus is interacting with is not a Jew, because it's important to understand the following interaction that Jesus has with her. Now, from the very beginning of her interaction with Jesus, the woman demonstrates incredible faith. She believes that Jesus can help her. She comes to Him, only having heard of Him and what He can do, and she falls at His feet. 
and pleads with him. Now, if you want a nice image for what you just did in the confession absolution, here you go. That's what we're doing. We're falling at the feet of Jesus. We know that He doesn't need to help us, that we have no reason to even be able to ask Him for help other than the mercy of Jesus. So this woman is doing the same thing. A fellow Gentile like you and I, laying ourselves at the feet of Jesus at His mercy. But it's from here on that the account becomes difficult for us, particularly those of us who have lived in the church that Jesus institutes. We come to know and expect what the reaction to our plea for mercy will be. I mean, imagine if you came into church next week and you did your confession, then I turned around and said, too bad. That's the last straw. You would be shocked. Just like we're shocked at Jesus' response to this woman's plea. In verse 27, he says, And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> what? Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? Now, in Greek, the, the word here used for dog is the diminutive term, so it's more like puppy. So maybe. There's, there's a couple of grammatical indicators that this isn't Jesus hurling an insult at the lady, but rather that this is a disagreement on the timing of Jesus' ministry to those outside of the people of God. But even in that context, the words of Jesus still shock us, because Jesus is supposed to help everyone who asks Him to do so, isn't He? So what is the deal here? Well, you know, the interesting thing is the woman's faith believes that truth as well. She believes that Jesus is supposed to help her. And so her reaction to Jesus' statement is quite amazing. She says, verse 28, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. I think if I was standing there and I heard this response, I think my mouth would be hanging open. The kind of faith that it would take to hear what Jesus said and immediately respond, not only I understand what you're saying, but to call Him Lord and remain at His mercy. But that's what she does. Jesus essentially is saying here, I'm not here for you yet, but her response indicates she believes that His help is such that it's going to overflow from the people of God to the entire world. And we've already seen little glimpses of this with the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and all the, the crumbs that were left over. And this is going to be leading into, in chapter 8 of Mark, the feeding of the 4,000 who are thought to be Gentiles and not Jews that Jesus is bringing this ministry not, for, not only to the people of God, but first to them and through them to the entire world. Well, that's good news for us Gentiles today. Jesus is similarly impressed, as I would be, with this woman's faith, because He mentions it specifically in His response. He says to her specifically the reason that He helps her. In verse 29, He says, for this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter for this statement. Now, of course, we know it's the faith demonstrated in that statement that Jesus is responding to. What happens? She goes home. She takes Jesus at His word, and when she gets home, her daughter is well, and the demon is gone. God's word did what He said it would. But the striking thing is that everything about Jesus in this account seems far away. Jesus doesn't want to be known or seen. He doesn't seem keen on the conversation He has with the Gentile woman, and He essentially tries to put her off. Not now, not yet. So not only is He distant in those instances in sort of a relational way, 
like you would describe someone being distant in a conversation that you're having with them. But you'll notice that he's also distant from the person who needs his help physically, which is contrasted with our next account and many other miracle accounts where the people who need to be healed are brought to Jesus. This woman doesn't bring her daughter. Instead, she's back at home. So, the daughter isn't even here, and yet still she is healed. Imagine being the woman returning home for a moment. Jesus has said, your daughter is well. But as she goes home, she doesn't know that yet. She believes it to be true. But imagine how she felt when she got home and realized it was true. God's Word does what it says, whether you're far or near. Now, this account is extremely comforting to us when we feel like Jesus isn't near to us or to those we love, because the devil and our own sinful flesh are going to try to convince us that that means that he's not going to help or that he can't help. And it's easy to let that thought grow in our minds, especially when things aren't going the way we hoped for or prayed for. But here in Mark 7, we're taught that even when Jesus seems far away, He isn't. And even when we can't see the connection, He can. And that connection is His Word. And His Word does what it says. As I share with the children today here in church, that Word tells you the same things when you lay yourself at the feet of Jesus. He responds with forgiveness of sins, eternal life, forever with Him. And He does it through tangible, objective means, through another person speaking His Word to you, through the physical, material world and the gifts imbued with His promises of water and bread and wine. Now we get to our second account. Now, there's a lot of details in the second account that I'm not going to go into because our focus is going to be on the contrast between the Syrophoenician woman and this deaf man. Now, here Jesus heals another Gentile in the region of the Decapolis. And another reason we don't see Jesus' exchange with the woman as an insult is now seen in His interaction with this Gentile. He has no problem coming very close to Him and touching Him and treating Him with the sort of compassion that we have expected from Jesus. But this one is a little bit more familiar of a structure for a miracle healing that we're used to. Friends who know of Jesus bring their friend who needs His help to Jesus and ask Him to put His hands on Him to heal Him. So Jesus takes Him aside. So Jesus is the one pulling Him close. And then Jesus proceeds to do a very physical and visceral healing miracle. He touches His ears and His mouth. Now, when I first read this when I was younger, I had the same reaction as Lucas. Gross. Why is He doing that? Right? But then I was thinking about it more, and I was listening to somebody talking about this set of verses, and they pointed out the beauty of what Jesus does here, because He understands the disability this person has, and that He is communicating with Him in a way that can be understood. Because previously with the woman, He has a discourse, but He can't do that here. So how does He communicate His compassion and His mercy? He does it through touch, so that He knows He's about to be healed. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. It wasn't the fingers in the ears or the spittle on the tongue, but the Word of God. Just like it brought healing for the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, it brings healing here because God's Word does what it says. Here in the nearness of Jesus, it's no different. His Word does what it says. Dear friends in Christ, the exact same Word 
is spoken to you today. It was spoken to you in the absolution when Jesus, through a pastor, forgave your sins. They are forgiven. God's Word does what it says. When you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and became a new creation, a child of God, it really happened because God's Word does what it says. And when you come to the table of the Lord today and the words given and shed for you are spoken and you receive that gift, you'll realize too that today and every Sunday, Jesus touches your ears and your mouth too. God's Word does what it says. So today, regardless of whether you feel that Jesus is near to you or far away, or if you're praying for somebody that you think is not near to God, the message in Mark 7 is trust in His Word. It does what it says. Bring your requests like the Syrophoenician woman in the boldness of faith that Jesus is your hope a faith that knows He has come to save. He has promised in His own words to each and every one of you already. And He can do it because God's Word, whether you're near or whether it seems far away, does what it says. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes our human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the promises of Jesus until He comes again to make all things new. Amen.